Remote Work, uh, Challenges and Triumphs presentation. Uh, my name is Peter Bartell. Uh, Co-facilitating the session with me is Jennifer Bauschner, who works in uh, career services. And then um, Tori Lynn Crook also works in career services, is going to be behind the scenes along with Daisy Gillum. So um, thank you all for attending the session this evening. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, um, where you're from, what your major is, um, uh, your LinkedIn if you want to. These spaces are great for networking, right? So um, definitely welcome to the session. Uh, we're going to get started here. It is recorded as Daisy. It is recorded as Daisy just mentioned. So um, we're going to get started here. Uh, cameras and microphones, just FYI for attendees, will be disabled throughout the session. Just use the chat box feature, though. It should be towards the up, upper middle of your screen. Um, the icon and chat is open, so feel free to, like we said before, engage with colleagues there, ask questions. Um, and there will be time at the end for Q&A. So as the session goes along, absolutely, please, 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 um, any questions you have, list them there. Um, and and I'll be I'll be the one collecting them. And when we open it up, probably in the last half hour for Q and A, you'll be able to take that space there. So, all right, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is the access and accommodation. So I'll read this to you. While your experience here at Southern New Hampshire University is important to us, it is our policy and practice to create an inclusive and accessible learning environment. If there are aspects of this presentation's design or delivery that present barriers to accessibility, please notify the below. For online students, online accessibility center by emailing oac at snhu.edu or by phone at 866-305-9430. For campus students, campus accessibility center by emailing cac at snhu.edu or by phone at 603-644-3118. And for SNHU staff and faculty, human resources office by emailing hr at snhu.edu. Awesome. Go to the next slide. And uh, many of you found out about this event through Handshake, which is awesome. All of our events um, and jobs and internships, et cetera, are listed with our employer partners on Handshake. So uh, feel free, Tori Lynn's going to put a link in the chat as well, but um, feel free to access Handshake at any time um, and view the events. We always have them going on. Um, the uh, school year, so to speak, is heating up, so you'll be seeing more and more and more events um, like this one. And in this session, FYI, Realities of Remote Work, um, the focus specifically is on um, tips and tricks to work effectively in a remote environment. Um, not necessarily, and some may share, you know, that they have remote opportunities with their company, et cetera, but just know the focus is on educating you on how to work effectively in a remote environment. The pitfalls, the positives, the challenges, the triumphs, right? So um, we have roles and Jennifer will go into that with the panelists and different niches and you'll see what, what kind of work they do and how they work remotely um, effectively in a remote environment. So we'll get to the next slide. Um, Tori Lynn's going to put this contact info in the chat as well. Thank you, Tori Lynn, by the way. Um, COCE career at snhu.edu is our email if you need any career services assistance. So resume writing, uh, job search strategies, job search assistance. Um, we don't find jobs for you, right? But we'll assist you with that, providing resources. Handshake is a go-to, so make sure you hop on there, like we mentioned before, with the events tab. Um, interview prep, salary negotiation, anything you can think of career readiness related, we're there for you. There's also a number there on the screen, 888-672-1458. Jen, uh, Tori Lynn is going to put that in the chat as well. Um, and that, uh, that concludes that, but feel free to reach out to us at any time. And that's it for the housekeeping. Now I'm going to introduce Jennifer Bauschner um, with Southern New Hampshire University Career Services. Um, Jennifer is an internship administrator here. In the bottom left, you'll see the QR code for Jennifer. And then each of our panelists, by the way, have given permission for you all to scan the QR code and connect them with them on LinkedIn if you'd like. So um, feel free to do so. Um, again, as we're going on, um, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, your LinkedIn, etc. Um, so Jennifer has been on our career services team 
at SNHU for just over a year and a half and supporting students in higher education for about four years. Before transitioning to higher education, Jennifer held various roles in hospitality leadership from human resources to corporate operations to general manager. She holds an MBA with a concentration in human resource management from Pace University's Lubin School of Business and a Bachelor of Science in International Business and Accounting from Marymount College of Fordham Terrytown. So Jennifer, thanks so much for joining us. She's gonna take it from here with you all. Um, you all have access to and can read the um, the uh, bios on the screen, um, but Jennifer is gonna start facilitating questions for each of the panelists now. So Jennifer, take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Peter. I really appreciate you putting this together. We have some exciting things to discuss tonight, as Peter mentioned. And um, I'm going to facilitate and, and sort of choose um, our panelists to answer, to keep it a little organized. But um, I'll also open it up and make sure that all of our panelists have a chance to each or answer each question. So I'm going to start with Dana Jackson from Vergari International. And one of the things that Peter mentioned, Dana, is that we would discuss how to work effectively and efficiently in a remote environment. So can you start by sharing with us what is your best tip for staying on task in a remote environment? Hey, yes. Yeah. So my number one that I've kind of learned since entering the remote workspace has been finding my own discipline. It's not always easy working in the comfort of your own home or in a cafe. Um, one of the biggest things that I do like to kind of go over is you have to kind of find your fuel for your discipline. So for me to kind of explain that, I like to give a little bit of a backstory. So my business partner and I, Tori, um, we've been working in the remote space for a couple of years, but we've also been able to call a number of beautiful places home, uh, Mexico, Thailand, and currently Bali. Now, with that also comes a whole new set of distractions, i.e. main one being I want to explore more. So my fuel and, and how it kind of keeps me on task is creating those disciplinary actions where I can keep those rewards as exploring the, the world as a reward to actually completing my tasks. So until I have my set tasks completed and done, I make sure to hold back and complete everything that I've set out to do. So that's going to be the main one. It's finding your why and finding your fuel, but that's how at least I currently stay on task. I make sure that I'm fueled by my discipline. I love that, Dana. I think I, I took away from that having discipline and then rewarding yourself for it. So I think that's great. And that's <laughs> that applies well in life in general, but even more important um, when you're working remotely. Uh, Jessica, I'd like to turn it to you, Jessica Chubbick from Northern Light Health, to um, share with us what is your best tip for staying on task in a remote environment? Yeah, absolutely. So um, a little bit different. My struggle is I've got animals running around the house. I've got laundry piles. I have dishes to do. And it can be difficult to sit down and focus on work when all this other chaos is happening around you. And you can think of a million things on your to-do list to accomplish. <laughs> So uh, what I try to do when staying on task, similar to Dana, I do try to use you know my discipline and also the reward aspect of, okay, once I get through these you know back-to-back -back meetings this morning, then I can take a walk at lunch and I'll take the dogs out and that will calm everybody down and maybe I can throw in a load of laundry in the meantime. But it's really making sure that you can balance the difference between your home priorities right and your work priorities so my tip is to put it in your calendar i try to live by my calendar and make sure that everything's on there including when i'm taking time to do things at home so if i have an appointment or if i have you know something important i want to run an errand for i put that on my calendar build it into my schedule and that helps me to stay on task. I love that. And yeah, use of the calendar, so important. My uh, my philosophy is if it's not on there, it's probably not gonna happen. So 
Great advice. Thank you so much. And uh, next we have Gloria Lee from Somos, which is a fully virtual company. So Gloria, would you share with us what is your best tip for staying on track in a remote environment? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I'm going to take it in a, a little bit different of a direction here because my challenge isn't necessarily on staying on task. My challenge is shutting off when the day is done. I think that when you work remotely, particularly when you're working from home, it can blend all of your work and all of your personal life can all meld together. And that can be really challenging in trying to achieve work-life balance, which is one of the biggest perks of being virtual, right? No commute, no, uh, no need to go in and out of an office. And so it's a perk, but it also can be a real challenge. So uh, for me, I make sure to have routine before my workday starts and when my workday ends to really just make sure I have that break. So I work out almost every morning. It's something that I do and it's really important to me. And that makes sure that I don't actually sit in my seat to start working until around 9 a.m. And then when I'm done with the day, I make sure to make time to walk my dogs because that makes that break in between. Um, like I said, I think working remotely is, is hugely rewarding in so many ways, but you have to be careful about how you break up your day and keep your personal life as balanced as you can with your work life. So I created routine on each end of my day to make sure that I have the time to actually break from the work that I do. I love that, that routine transition. I actually um, have a coworker who told me that one of the ways that she transitions is she actually puts her shoes on and walks out of her house in the morning and comes back in and goes to her office and then does the same thing at the end of the day as a, as a way to separate, like you said, because you're right, that's so important. Personal and work just meld together when it's all in one place. So yeah, thank you for sharing that important point. And finally, um, we have Ben Lord with us from F Equifax. Ben, could you share with us what is your best tip for staying on task in a remote environment, please? Sure, happy to, um, Jennifer. I would just say mix it up. Um, working remotely does not necessarily mean working from home or working from your desk. A couple of examples that are seem silly, but they've served me well. I need this monitor for some stuff, but sometimes I'm like, I've been in this room all day and my bed is right there. Um, so I've literally unplugged this monitor, set a bench on my kitchen table with paper towels under the legs because my wife doesn't like it, you know, on the table. So I'm like, I put little paper towels under it. It's fine. Um, perfect standing desk, literally like when my brain was just fried one day and I was like, this is it. Like they, the, w nothing is stopping me from, you know, calling it a day. Um, literally just popping into the kitchen and I set a um, candle there and started burning it. And like, I was, I was vibing. I was off to the races. I've also driven one mile up the road to Wendy's and gotten a um, large diet Dr. Pepper and just gotten a lot of refills and, you know, grind it out for a few hours there. I, I, I could probably list a million examples like that because it just gets so monotonous being in one room. And so being able to break that up has been huge for me. Yeah, I think that's such an important point too. I'll tell you, there's nothing quite like that first beautiful day of spring where you can take a meeting outside, right? Like that, <laughs> talking about breaking it up. So that's that's always so nice to do. Well, thank you all. I think those are really great tips to get the conversation started. Um, I'm gonna move on to our next question. And I'm gonna ask Gloria to start us off this time. So Gloria, if you would share for us, what are your best practices for staying in communication with your coworkers and what communication channels work best for you? Yeah, that's great. And um, it's, it's my job these days. So uh, my work is really around architecting uh, a remote experience that is also collaborative, that's engaging, that is uh, keeping uh, employees where they are. And I'm in a fully virtual world. So that is a new challenge in and of itself. Um, I would say 
being very mindful of not only bringing in work to your day to day, but also bringing in time to be with your team. And that's not necessarily icebreakers and happy hours and things like that in the virtual environment. It really can just be ways to get to know each other um, in a Zoom meeting. So spending time in each of your meetings or in each of your days just getting to know your team members. And that can be on Zoom, that can be in Slack chat. You can figure out how to communicate in emojis like I do most of the time, but really bringing an element of uh, being human to uh, whatever you're doing virtually is so important because you miss that face-to-face -face interaction unless you're very deliberate about maintaining that connection. Yes, that human side is so important. You know, you start to see people as a computer screen after a while, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you don't do that and keep that that connection and take the time to build that connection. So great, great points. Thank you so much. Um, Dana, Jessica, or Ben, would you like to I'll let you kind of volunteer? Who wants to go next and share your best practices? Dana, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so actually I'm going to touch on what Jessica had mentioned about living by the calendars because quite literally Tori and I are on the opposite side of the world and we live in the future. So being mindful of the daily, the weekly, the monthly, the annual goals and also being mindful of all the other time zones. I mean, that has been super crucial to making sure that our communication is strong. Uh, a lot of follow up, a lot of check ins. Um, and then as far as communication goes, our, our tools have been really great with Google. All things Google have been great. We use WhatsApp with group, uh, group chats, keep everybody neat and tidy in one group. So all the information is related into one little neat and tidy area. But yeah, definitely check in and follow up constantly. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, staying, staying connected, making sure everyone knows you're there, right? <laughs> um, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, Jessica or Ben, do either of you want to add to that? Go ahead, Jessica. Thanks. Yeah, I'll say, um, so I supervise a hybrid team. So there are some that are working remotely permanently. There are some who come into the office a few days a week. There are some who are in the office every day of the week. So something that our team has done, and we utilize Microsoft Teams for pretty much everything. We have a Teams chat that is a kudos chat. So we just kind of keep a general conversation running, funny things we've heard through the day or, you know, shout outs to team members. But we also have a at three o'clock every day, we have a 30 minute, it's 30 minutes blocked off, but usually it's only 15 where it's a kind of like, well, it, we call it Wayne's world because there was a coworker of mine, Wayne, who loved to tell dad jokes. Who doesn't love that? And so every day at three o'clock, if you have the time, you can log on and listen to Wayne tell jokes. We do some trivia and then we all go back to work. But it's really created a bonding experience and a lot of inside jokes and bringing people together. So it doesn't matter if they're in the office with Wayne or not. We all are a part of that experience. And uh, I think that's a key part, too. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And I'm so glad you brought up the impact of hybrid because so often that's the world now, you know, we're talking remote, but it's it's really a mix of both. So thank you for, for bringing that into the conversation. Ben, did you wanna share any thoughts on your communication approach and channels? Yeah, it's just, I feel like you have to be maybe a little more intentional to add that human connection. Um, so for me, I, I'm usually the first person to, if I've got something kind of random and just not, not even, not even super novel or crazy, but just, just something that's, that's a personal thing that I can share that I'm up to or, or something that I'm struggling with, like opening up about a couple of things like that. And then the commiseration and the head nods, and then, you know, um, keeping that thread going. If somebody mentions something they're struggling with, ask them about it. And sometimes it's, you know, for me, it's text because we have, you know, we use Google chat for work related instant messaging, but it's, it's nice to be able to commiserate and have a thread going over, over text. That's about, you know, just laugh, kind of that water cooler um, type conversation. It, it has 
de-escalated so many projects, y'all, where I, I went through a project with people and I only knew them in their work capacity because they weren't on my normal team. Um, and between that project and the next one, um, I was able to get to know those people a little bit better outside of work. And, you know, if they're going to read into your tone, they they read it with a smile because they they've gotten your vibe rather than just assuming that, you know, everybody's out to get each other. So, you know, that that just goes a long ways if you can try to, you know, humanize the folks you're working with. Yeah, I think that's great. And I you you bring up a good point about tone of communication because we do so much written communication now. So it probably wasn't as important previously from a writing perspective because you could always talk to the person and kind of clarify, but now it's got to be very clear in writing. So thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, great insights from all of you. I'm going to move us into the next question. And we started to, uh, we alluded to this a little bit with the first question and talking about workspace. Um, Jessica, I'm going to have you start us off if that's okay. And tell us what what is your recommended workspace setup when you're working from home to maximize productivity? Oh. Jessica, would you mind starting us off? I was just going to say, you there? sorry. Okay. <laughs> my internet just went. Thank you. So I, I saw you question. freeze. I got a little nervous, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Let me repeat the question. So um, what is your recommended workspace setup when working from home to maximize productivity? Yes, um, definitely being in a in a room away from distractions is key for me if I'm very easily distracted. So I need it to be quiet um, or listening to, you know, some sort of focus music in my own space. I turn off distractions on my phone. Um, I mute Teams chats sometimes if I can, because, you know, some of those fun ones are pinging a lot and I'm not going to be able to focus. Um, so I like to have that. And then I also like the ability to be flexible. I don't sit still very well. So I have a standing desk that I will move up and stand at, walk around. I have a treadmill that goes under my desk that I will walk on, although I'm not super graceful walking and typing yet, still working on it. Um, but all of those types of things help me to move my body, but also stay focused and accomplish what I need to accomplish. Um, I think that if if you're not able to be in a room that's closed off, then it's just important to make sure everybody in the household knows that during this time, you know, if we could be quiet, I have two dogs that bark at the most inopportune times. So I, I try to have somebody around who can wrangle them if need be for those meetings where I really can't have any distractions. Yeah. That's important. We've developed a lot of code in my house. You know, if the door is closed a certain way, mom's on video, stay out, right? Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. Thank you so much. Um, Gloria, Dana, or Ben, who wants to chime in next on workspace setup? Oh, Ben, go ahead. Workspace setup. I would say um, don't be afraid to get creative, like I mentioned, the makeshift standing desk earlier, but also if you can invest for, you know, the treadmill, the standing desk, whatever it is, like, um, think of all the money you're saving on gas and invest some of it for leverage that's going to really, really add up over years of being at your desk. I mean, I, I went way too long without buying the second monitor, and I, I'm so much more efficient now that I have it. I mean, things like that. Uh, and ask your employers um, if they'll let you expense a couple of things like that, because it's going to help you do more for them. There's, there's a fair chance they will, and it never hurts to ask. Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome idea, Ben. And yeah, because employers are, are saving on those tools that maybe you'd have in the workspace, right? So good way to, to transfer that investment. Dana or Gloria, did you want to add in? Dana, I think I saw you coming off mute. Oh, actually, maybe Dana, you're frozen. How, how about you, Gloria? <laughs> yeah, I, I was just going to chime in on the standing desk. Uh, however you make it, 
please make it because I'm telling you, after spending multiple years, speaking of distractions, <laughs> after spending multiple years sitting, I can't tell you what a number it does on your back. So invest in a standing desk, see if your employer will cover it for you. A lot of them do, um, particularly employers that are familiar with uh, remote workers and, and the needs of remote workers. Um, a lot of them will have some type of stipend or some type of benefit to support you in getting set up properly because they want you set up properly so that you can do your job the best you can too. Uh, but standing desk, any type of space where um, it's dedicated to work, and that's for two reasons. One, so you can focus on work when uh, it's work time, but also so you can shut the door or shut the space off and get away from it when you're done. Yeah. Great points. Thank you. Yeah, I think that getting up and being able to stand and walk around and even stretching your seat, you know, one of the things I've really learned to do is stretching. My, I'm, you know, stretching right now, my legs, my feet, right? Nobody knows. So being constantly um, sitting down really does bring trauma to the body, like you said. So we've got to bring that movement in as much as we can. That's awesome. Dana, did you want to add any thoughts here? Yeah, so one of the biggest things that I've always believed in is clutter is absolute chaos. It is madness when you are trying to work in an environment that is so totally messy, right? Messy mind, messy room, messy room, messy mind. So I always want to be mindful that my space, my desk, wherever I am, um, is clear of clutter. So that doesn't distract me and I'm literally focused on what I'm doing. Dana, I'm not going to show you my desk right now. Luckily, I have this beautiful <laughs> background. <laughs> no, actually, it's better than normal. So I'll tell you, by Friday, though, it won't be so good. <laughs> but that is a, that's a great point, right? Because like, if you were in the office, you would be organized and clean. So you should be you should be at home, too. So good, good point. Um, I've got I've got one more question. It's a it's a two part question. And Ben, I'm going to start with you this time. So um, when you're thinking about, you know, hiring people to work, what are your considerations um, when you're thinking about if it should be remote or in person, right? So what are you, what are you thinking about as in determining if the requisition should be in person or remote? And then are there different qualities that you look for in a candidate that come across as a better fit? Um, for being on site or remote? Do you want, I know that's a little complicated, so do you want me to say that again? So essentially we're, we're talking about um, when we're trying to, when you're trying to figure out if a, if a position is better for remote or in person, what are those considerations you're making? Um, and then what are the different qualities that you look for that come across as a better fit, whether it's remote or on site? Yeah, so just to be completely honest, if I feel like it's a role that there's somebody in, there is a qualified pool of candidates in driving distance, it would be tempting to start there. It, it, it just would. The more specific you get with the skill set you're looking for, the more it's like, okay, how much does this really matter? Um, that. Just because, I mean, it's hard to beat that um, in-person interaction, even if it's just once or twice a week. So that's that's where I would start, and then I would consider um, zooming out. And I mean, y'all y'all know this. If you look at the, I don't want to say generic, but the the remote roles that um, that get posted that are relatively standard jobs. I mean, people just swarm on them. I, I mean, they, um, so the more specialized, the more success, really, I think that you'll have um, as a remote candidate, I guess, if I were to reverse engineer that. Um, as far as what qualities I look for, I would say somebody who, the, the discipline and the initiative, any hints of that that I get with a remote candidate, I, I'm going to be all over it. And I think you have to have a certain amount of, of just courage and willingness to cut through the awkwardness. People people don't mind tapping your shoulder at your desk. People sometimes hate picking up the phone, you know? I mean, and sometimes you need to work something out and it 
doesn't need to be a formal email or they don't need to be overthinking how they word it. Like you just need to talk it out. And so that that's intimidating for certain people. And so I think understanding just having that get it done mindset um, and, and the initiative with that would, would make a really good remote candidate in my mind. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, Jessica, Gloria, or Dana, do you want to chime in? Anyone? Just kind of raise your hand so I know who wants to go next. Okay, Gloria, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I'm a fully virtual employer, and so I have a little bit different of a take than I'd say than you might, um, in that uh, we're looking, every single one of our roles is virtual. And so when we're looking at candidates, we have the benefit of being able to look for the very best talent wherever they're seated. So it doesn't matter if they're in California or Virginia or Massachusetts, um, go Red Sox, by the way. Uh, but it doesn't it doesn't matter where you are. We're looking for the very best talent. And I think as a virtual employer, that's a huge advantage to us uh, because we don't have to look in the walls of a certain city or area. Um, that said, it presents its own challenge. And how do you make sure that you're recruiting or finding talent that's going to be able to thrive in the virtual first or remote environment? Uh, and there are two things I'd say to that. One, the employer really needs to be set up and understand how to create the best virtual experience for employees. And then we need to find employees that are really interested in collaborating in new and innovative ways, not just looking for that traditional um, desk job where they go in and they have an expectation of this is how I'll communicate. They have to be open, they have to be agile, um, and they have to be really ready to try new things with us. So that's awesome. That agility, one of my favorite words, and having that growth mindset, I think so important mm -hmm. to be successful in this Absolutely. environment. Awesome. Jessica or Dana, do you want to chime in? Go ahead, Dana. Yeah. Yeah, I'll chime in. Uh, actually, very similarly, Vagari is a completely 100% remote workspace. So for us, our main thing is we are looking for uh, employees that are able to communicate, but also to go over and maybe go a couple steps ahead and maybe we come back and forth a lot. There's a lot of questions that come back, but we do want those students or employees coming in, we want them to be able to embrace the creativity of, of what they want to go, but they also want to create that space and that navigation that the direction is clear, we know where we want to go, but we always make sure that the communication is, is there. So also touching on the organizational skills, we want them to be able to organize not only their schedules, but organize their thoughts. So we're really looking for people who are really a, on their A-game on the communication side. Yeah, so important. Yes, thank you so much, Dana. Jessica, do you have any thoughts to add? Um, so we are not virtual, it, fully remote in any way uh, for Northern Light Health because we staff the hospitals. However, um, we do have the remote positions and most of our remote positions are tied to the traditional desk job type one. So a lot of our um, a lot of our IT positions, a lot of our accounting positions, my own position, a lot of our recruitment positions are able to be remote or hybrid. That being said, we also use a system approach. So we have a, an umbrella of Northern Light Health and we have 10 different hospitals throughout Maine and numerous different practices. So if the position is more a system level where the person might be working with multiple hospitals, it's more likely to be a remote position because it gives them that flexibility, not only to not have to be located at one place, but also to travel to the different locations and to see the different people, um, to experience the different events that they're putting on. So there is a bit of flexibility when it comes to the travel aspect and remote parts when it's more of a, the system level in our world. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's great insight. And I think that's one of the things that people are often wondering, you know, what makes a job suitable for remote? So thank you all for sharing that because that really helped clarify there. 
And uh, I want to thank you for your thoughts thus far. I know we have had a super active chat going on here. So I'm going to actually pass it back over to Peter, who's going to um, share some questions that our attendees are asking in the chat. So over to you, Peter. Thanks all. Uh, great info so far. Thanks, Jennifer. So um, Dana McGrath actually just shared in the chat, if you guys want to pull out a career page for each company um, who's on the panel, um, since there seems to be a lot of questions around specifically, hey, what types of remote work, um, et cetera. So for these companies, um, it's there. Just wanted to state that broadly before we dive into more questions, more focused around um, actually working remotely and, and um, strategies around it. Um, but additionally, just FYI for anybody in attendance, check out Handshake for sure. And they actually just added recently a um, a remote button you can click if you're looking for remote jobs specifically. I don't want to get too much into it to get away from the focus of the panel, but I um, wanted to state that. So some good questions came through. Kelly Cook uh, also responded to Joy's question, which I thought was well earlier. Um, and it was discussed on the panel already a little bit about um, actual office, like desk, et cetera, um, how important is it? So we're not gonna address that, but I wanted to point it out. And, and Kelly, thank you so much for the extensive answer. I thought that was spot on. Um, so the first question we're gonna go into is from Steve Ince. Uh, Steven asked, how does one get their foot in the door for remote work and what are the benefits of remote work in your opinions? Um, not all have to answer. Whoever wants to answer can take the floor first on this. For a um, foot in the door, I would say there are probably a few instances where you can have a face-to-face -face interaction with somebody networking and it will lead to remote work, but I would think 90% of the time it's going to be fully digital. So making sure your online presence really, really shines. Your LinkedIn, your, you know, um, anywhere online. I mean, if you're answering a Quora question, et cetera, like, it counts triple time, I would think, if, if that's the only way people are going to gauge you. So that that could be a start. Yeah, I can share uh, So two pieces of advice. The first is really make sure you research uh, the companies that are offering virtual work so that you understand that they uh, are committed to that virtual experience. I think particularly with COVID, a lot of companies went out and said, we're virtual, we're remote, let's do this. And then now they're trying to figure out how to incorporate culture and people and how do they actually do it is now becoming an issue for um, some teams. So really do research on the companies that you're interested in and make sure that they're really devoted and, and able to accommodate and support you as a remote employee. Um, the other thing to Ben's point, because virtual positions are nationwide, you're going to see a ton of applicants to any of the positions that are posted as remote. And so you need to do a lot of work, a lot of background on understanding who the recruiter might be for that role. If there's a way that you can find a connection with the company, uh, definitely do that. Make sure your resume not only is up to date and um, in good condition, but also has keywords and has uh, relevant information to it in the job that you're applying to because recruiters are going to go in and they're going to do keyword searches on uh, the resumes that uh, people have applied with. And so if your uh, resume isn't relevant to the role that you applied, you're going to have a hard time getting uh, yourself in front of someone, um, which at the end of the day, you might be fully qualified for that role. But unless your resume shows the recruiter or shows the recruiting team that you are, it can be challenging with the volume um, of applicants that come through. So two pieces of advice. Good stuff. Yeah, go ahead, Dana. I'll also touch on actually uh, both Ben and Gloria. So we do get a lot of resumes. We do get a lot of things coming through. And one of the also the main things that I would also say is find that something that why that also creates the distinctiveness between you and somebody else that's something special that you have that's something spark that whatever you have is going to make you stand apart from the rest i mean there's a lot of qualified people out there but what is going to push you towards the top of the list and why is that so i think figuring out that would be my major key 
having that passion is definitely it can it can show so thank you for that thank you for the answers uh, as well ben and gloria and the next question comes from dave he's a majoring in finance he wants to know what were some of the setbacks or failures you experienced early on in working from home i can start uh, <laughs> i feel like i've experienced them all um thinking that you can working from home means that you can double double dip a lot, you know, and like I mentioned earlier that you can also accomplish all of your chores and that you can, you know, also have time to relax more during the day and all of these things. And it's, you really have to think of it just like you're going into the office. And that's something that if, you, you know, you'll, you'll hear it and you're like, okay, yeah, I'll do that. And then the first time you get into it, you're thinking, oh no, I can do a bunch of other things. If you have the downtime or anything like that. So I definitely fell into that trap where trying to do too many things at once, you know, I'm at the grocery store, I'm taking phone calls, I'm emailing people from the parking lot. So just making sure that you're, you're actually um, meeting the expectations of your employer, but also making sure that you're not doing anything, you know, you can't do two things really well, right? At the same time, you, you've got to pick and choose during your day. So I would say that and and not making or making sure that anybody around you, your family and everything knows that just because you're at home doesn't change anything. I have neighbors that will come over. Well, I thought I could come by because I know you're just going to be at home. Well, would you just come by my office? You know, so just kind of making sure to set those expectations to those around you because um, not everybody understands it. Kind of on the other side of that coin, I was just so paranoid about, you know, putting a good day's work and what does that look like? And when you're not looking at other people at their desks, it's easy to just feel like you have to squeeze every second of productivity out of every minute when folks don't do that at the office either, y'all. Like, like the sooner you can define what a good day's work is that's sustainable, that's not, you know, nose to the grindstone, that involves, you know, calling your mom when you know she's on her drive or whatever else, um, things that, you know, when I'm at work, I might slip into a conference room for, otherwise you will burn out quickly. And, and I, I did to a small extent. So figuring out what success looks like and being realistic and thinking about sustainability is going to go a long way. I could not agree more, Ben, and I think you've heard me talk a little bit earlier about making sure you have time to turn on and turn and time to shut off because everything can really easily blend together. And you can hurt yourself, you can hurt your relationships around you if you're not really careful to separate work from home. That said, uh, you know, there are going to be times, just like at the office, where you are distracted by something and you should feel empowered to be distracted from time to time. I think most employers uh, that offer remote work, uh, for being honest, are going to put something in their employee handbook that says that you're unable to provide full-time care to someone else and work remotely at the same time. So those things where it's going to require full-time attention likely isn't going to be able to work out for you in a remote capacity at work as well. But you've got to find ways to balance. And you've got to find ways, you know, you used to go when you were commuting to work, you would call your mother. Well, you're not commuting anymore. So when can you find that time? Um, so really, uh, the world is changing uh, rapidly, whether or not we're ready for it. And work is becoming more about outcomes than it is punching a clock. And that's really where your focus should be. What am I contributing to my organization? Am I meeting my deadlines? Am I hitting all of my goals? If that's the case, make sure you're taking care of yourself too, because it can be really difficult in a virtual world to find that balance. I think that goes along well with a question that Karen just asked that answer Gloria and Ben specifically. So thank you. Is it feasible or acceptable to accept visits as she put it during work, right? So maybe that is calling your mom or having a, Jessica mentioned like a neighbor over like, you know, would you would you come over if I was at the office? The answer is no, but like uh, be reasonable 
Um, and I, I love how Ben put it, define a good day's work, right? Like, okay, if you were super productive in those six or seven hours, like, yes, yeah, stay working, but maybe it's okay to have that visit or somebody like that. So um, thank you, Karen, for that question that fed right into those answers. Uh, we have a few more questions, so keep them coming. Um, I have um, a few more, and we'll get to what we can. Um, Zach Shel Shackleton said, similar to online schoolwork, how would one overcome the obstacle of feeling overwhelmed or even stuck with remote work in their own home? So I'll open that up to everybody. Commiserating with coworkers over the phone, pick them up like, man, do you ever, do you ever just, you know, like talk about the struggle with somebody who maybe is not your boss and doesn't sign your paycheck. Maybe they're in a whole nother department um, because not that your boss would necessarily not understand, but you need somebody you feel psychologically safe with. Maybe it's somebody at a different company who also works remotely. The commiseration when you start realizing you're not alone, like that, that goes a long way. And then also local meetups um go go get drinks at a bar with maybe maybe there's a big company that's headquartered um in your town and you have a friend that works there go with them things like that really give me a lot of juice go ahead Anna. yeah so i think with everything virtual and remote we really ingest a lot of screen time and one of the biggest things that you know, we have a really good connection with our Wi-Fi sometimes and with all of our everything that we're working on online. But I find sometimes if I get really overwhelmed, if not for five minutes, maybe an hour, my lunch break, whatever it may be, I take a step outside. I put my feet in the ground. I connect with nature. I look at the sun, the rain, whatever it is. And I just make sure be mindful of me and my inner peace. And that way, too, I think that kind of declutters my brain so I can actually go back take a deep breath and actually continue on in, in a different headspace. So that really does help me just even if for five minutes, if you can. Good stuff. I'm um, similar, right? A lot like just, I think, was it Gloria that said she walks her dog at the end of the day, something to unplug, get step away. So thank you, Dana, for sharing that. All right, next question. Um, Destiny Dudley asked, I have heard that more and more employers are looking for online portfolios from candidates. Um, do you guys find this the case with your companies, even if not for requisitions you're involved in or have any insight on that? I would just say for me, I think it depends on the role that we're hiring for. I think that if the role is customer facing um, virtually, then we are looking for examples of how they've customer faced virtually, if you will. Uh, but it, it's not something that a lot of our roles require. So, gotcha. But the online presence, the, so, the, the social media presence uh, is really key. Awesome. LinkedIn's a really good happy medium without a full-fledged binlord.com portfolio. My profession, for example, involves writing. And so LinkedIn has a platform where you can publish a blog post natively, and it's like a real life sample right there. Or if you do something um, meaningful, post about it, tell why it was special, post a picture, and you can pin those to your featured section um, so that when people click your profile, they're the first few things they see. It's almost like a little mini portfolio, again, without the learning curve and blood, sweat, and tears of uh, your own website. But it, it does depend heavily on the profession. I would say definitely uh, profession specific. We have two, I shared it in the chat. There's a YouTube channel for any students that are interested in the portfolios, um, how to create them when they're relevant, et cetera. We have a career YouTube page and I, I believe we have a presentation or two recorded on there um, previous that, that goes into that. All right, um, the next question, let's see, I almost closed it. Um, Work-life balance, right? We've talked about it 
in different ways a bit, but this question's from Nicole Brown. Does working from home make it more difficult to establish a work-life balance? Go ahead, Dana. Uh, personally, I found it extremely difficult to shut off and also turn it back on when I have also been on for so long, right? So it's, you gotta have to, it's personal for everybody, right? Everyone's gonna be different. But what I really found is, again, the stepping away concept, but you have to also make sure that you're being mindful of how many hours do I wanna get done? Do I really wanna go over and above? So for example, sometimes when I'm on a roll or when anybody's on a roll, you wanna keep going. You don't wanna stop that train of thought but it comes to a point in time where sometimes you will get exhausted. So you do need to have, you do have to understand you deserve a break and you work a little bit better when you have rest. So finding that balance is, is very difficult for some and for me personally as well, but yeah, it is very crucial to find that. One way it might could actually, oh, sorry, Gloria. Um, one way it might could actually help is if you just embrace the fact that it is results oriented. I mean, assuming somebody hasn't said, be at your desk, be available eight to five, I'm a morning person. So there are times when I'm rocking and rolling at 7 a.m. and from seven to nine, I probably get more done than um, you know some of my teammates will until noon. And that's, that's great because you know maybe I cut out a little early that afternoon, or maybe I feel like if I'm doing some of the you know, administrative stuff, the calls you have to make during business hours, stuff like that. I don't feel guilty about it. Whereas at work, if I get there at eight, I leave at five, um, then it, it is just hard to make it all happen. But so if you embrace the the flexibility it offers and lean into your, you know, most productive times, then it might could actually help the work-life balance. Yeah, I would totally agree. And it's interesting, you're hearing all of us talking about how uh, work-life balance is really challenging when you're remote because you're unable to turn it off and learning how to turn it off is, is uh, a challenge. So many people are worried about employers thinking that you're not working enough when you're remote. And I find that the opposite is true. I find that I'm, I'm more often having conversations with people about how do you balance it out because it can be so difficult to do. Um, you know, the other, the other thing I'll say is, again, when you're looking at a new world, uh, work-life balance isn't something that necessarily happens. What you have to do is find there are going to be some times where you're working more and sometimes where life is going to take priority. So trying to find that 50-50 split, uh, you're seeking something that might not necessarily be there anymore. And so give yourself some grace on that as well. There are times where you're going to have to spend some extra time in your chair doing something that's a huge priority. And there'll be sometimes that your life takes that priority. So make sure you're, you're mindful to that. Yeah, the only thing I would add working in a in a hybrid environment is that you do, you know, it's a, it's difficult because you do have to be mindful of those who are in the office and who are abiding by those time frames. So um, a lot of times what I tell my people is, you know, I, I want you to work when it's the best time for you to work. I have a lot of people who have young children. Um, whether they're getting them to school or they have practices in the evenings or early afternoons, that's fine by me. I just ask that they communicate it. That's all the, the key is. And you'll know, say that you're out of your office for till 5 p.m. and you'll check emails later or however it goes. And like, you know, Gloria, you're right. It, it all shakes out in the end. Sometimes you're busier than others. And just giving people the permission to know that, but making sure they communicate it. That's that's really important. Absolutely. Communicate it and make sure that the team agrees with it. I think that, and that comes back to how do you uh, operate in a virtual environment, particularly when there are time zones and a million other things that impact when you work best. It's talking with your team and making sure they understand and that everyone agrees this is how we're going to work. Totally agree. 
definitely dependent on the company. So, or the type, not the company, the type of work, right? But it's it, it's that point you guys keep going back to, like, and it's, I've heard this, put it this way, in an office, you're measured by what time you clock in and out. When you work from home, you're measured on how much you accomplished. To Ben, ben said it, right? I think best to find a good day's work. Like, doesn't mean I work 10 hours versus five, how much you get done, you know? So I appreciate you all inputting on that. Dana, you were off mute sorry were you going to add anything it's fine if not um honestly flexibility has been very key for us as well not only offering the flexibility but we also want to be able to be flexible with our schedules right we're on a completely different time zone and a completely different day i mean i'm actually ahead of you guys right now living in the future so we want to be flexible enough where they understand that we need to know hey how many kids do you have dogs do you have family members that you want to go and see? Do you have other jobs going on? Do you have schoolwork? So we want to also give them the benefit of the doubt. Hey, what does your peak hours look like for us? What do those look like? And how can we accommodate those? So for us, it's, it's we need to be extremely flexible. And as do, as do anybody that we bring on, we want to make sure that they're comfortable in sharing, hey, you know what? I just don't have this time between this time and this time, but hey, I'm totally open. Later in the evening, I mean, whenever you can space out your day, that's that's going to be your peak hours. So flexibility, I think, would be my additive. Thanks for sharing. Uh, awesome, awesome flexibility for sure. Um, we'll conclude it here. We have three minutes left. So, um, but thank you all so much for attending. The, the session will be, I'm going to give panelists a final chance to um, state anything in closing that they'd like to. Um, um, but uh, but if anybody had anything else um, they wanted to share, they they definitely have the floor. Um, but um, just FYI for everybody in attendance, um, this will be recorded and uh, found on our career YouTube page um, in a day or two. So uh, just keyword like realities and realities and remote work should show up. Tori Lim put it in the chat earlier, so thank you, Tori Lim, for doing that. Um, but panelists, I'll give you all the floor if if you had anything in closing. Just want to encourage y'all and say it's an exciting time to be looking for work. I mean, um, there are more opportunities than ever. I mean, you can. It's just, it's just even even growing up, like I would have never imagined um, that when I graduated college, I could, you know go back and visit my alma mater one day and work from the library there, things like that. So lots of opportunities and I'm sure y'all are gonna rock it. I just dropped my email in the chat. I am happy to answer any questions that might pop up or help. Um, like I said, my company is, is definitely hybrid, but um, options are endless. And the other thing I wanted to mention, um, is if you see a job that's posted that you think maybe it could be hybrid, maybe it could be remote, it's worth talking to the recruiter about. I've had many, many hires that I've had where the position wasn't posted as remote or hybrid, but with the right candidate, we were able to do it. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Don't feel like you're bothering anybody. Um, it, it could be a really good move for you. Love it. And, you know, I, I echo Ben's statement that it's a really exciting time. The way we work is changing and uh, that equals opportunities for all of us to not only work in new capacities, but grow. Um, I'm finding that the career paths out there these days are so much different because we're exposed to very different types of work all at one time. And so take advantage of those opportunities. Always say yes to a project that you're interested in, even if you don't know a whole lot about it, because you'll never know where you'll end up um, by doing that. I, my career has gone all over the place. Um, I've been remote now since 2012, um, back when Zoom did not exist. Uh, and it's been really exciting to see how this world has evolved. So um, we're, in a, we're in a really cool time uh, and take advantage of it. I think what I would just like to add is don't be afraid to ask the hard questions, the second, the third, the fourth level. You never really know 
where those answers are going to go. And you really never know what questions are going to come up when you, when you ask that question. So if you don't ask, you'll never know. So that would be my main. We love, we love questions. Thank you all so much for attending. Tori Lynn, Jennifer, uh, Daisy, thanks for helping to moderate, facilitate, and uh, panelists, thank you again, um, and we'll catch everybody later. Thank you.